Let me come back to the rage for a second, because I would love to get your advice or at least hear of some of your learnings over the last decades. Because I recall from our first conversation that, you know, in your 40s, you're a successful doctor, you're a driven workaholic, you had challenges in your marriage, your kids were, at least based on my notes, sort of afraid of you at points because of your rages. That's right. What have you learned about rage and anger? How do you relate to it or metabolize it? And I ask as someone who has a long history of <laughs> running on anger as a maybe a corrosive fuel of sorts. So I would, I would love to just hear you expand on that in any way that makes sense. So there was a great neuroscientist. His name was Yak Panksepp, P-A-N-K-S-E-P-P. -P -P who tragically died a few years ago of cancer. And he distinguished a number of brain systems that we share with other mammals. <clears throat> they include uh, care. He, he capitalized these. So C-A-R-E, care. Then something he calls, he calls grief and panic. Then fear. Lust. Seeking. Play. And rage. These are all brain systems that we have. They're all necessary for mammalian life. They're all necessary. Now, the, by rage, he means the anger that arises when our boundaries are being transgressed. If I were to infringe on your boundaries, either physically or emotionally, the healthy response for you is to mount an anger response. No, get out. Stay away. That's healthy. Healthy anger is in the moment. It protects your boundaries, and then it's gone. It's not necessary anymore. However, if your boundaries were infringed as a child, but you could not express it, it doesn't disappear. It gets suppressed. It becomes almost like a volcano that's gurgling and, 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 and bubbling inside you, but it's had no expression. Now, why did you suppress it? Because if you're being, well, you've been very public about this, so I'm sure you'll allow me to mention it, but you've, some time after you and I talked, you actually publicly acknowledged that you'd been sexually abused as a child. I did. Now, when that's happening to a small child, the last thing you can afford is to is to be angry. Because if you get rageful at the boundary invasion, you're going to get hurt even more. So suppressing that rage becomes a survival mechanism. Nothing wrong with it. It's the right thing to do. You don't do it. Your brain will do it for you automatically as a way of preserving your life or your, or your relative safety. But the rage doesn't go away. What happens then later on as an adult, something triggers you and all of a sudden it just explodes out of you and you have no control over it. Now it's no longer a response, a healthy response to the present moment, but it's a response to the past. And just as my hurt and sense of abandonment and then rage was triggered by my wife not picking me up at the airport, so a person's rage can be triggered by something relatively minor but all of a sudden this lava flow just explodes out of you. And the difference between healthy anger, and by the way, suppressing healthy anger is also unhealthy for you, we can talk about that, but just as healthy anger expresses itself, does its job, and then it's gone, rage, the way such as I'm describing, such as the way I used to experience it, and probably as you used to experience it, the more it explodes, the bigger it gets. That's what happens to me. It doesn't it, it pass through. Me. Sorry? No, I was just reinforcing that by saying, you know, I've, I've worked with certain therapists who have said, you know, punch a pillow, express the rage, let it just pass through you like the wind. But that isn't, in fact, what happens with me. And I know I'm not the only one. It actually yeah. magnifies and intensifies and extends this feeling. Exactly, because it recruits more brain circuits into its service. So that's the difference between healthy anger on the one hand, which is an essential boundary defense, 
And by the way, so much parenting advice in this culture tells parents to force kids to suppress their anger. Really unhealthy advice. And、um, there's healthy anger, then there's that rage that you and I have both experienced. That, to work with that, no, it's, look, if you're going to punch a human being and there's a pillow to punch instead, better to punch the pillow. <laughs> right. No question about that. But as a technique of dealing with it, no, that's not how you learn to process that rage because it needs to be processed. How do you approach the processing? What is a more effective prescription or one possible way of thinking about it or approaching it? Well, if I was working with you, I would encourage you to fully experience the body experience of rage. What's happening in your body? And you'll find that it's not just an idea in your head, it's something that dominates your visceral experience of yourself, your muscles, your breathing, your abdomen, your entire nervous system. And、um, there's ways of just helping you experience it. Experience it by recognizing, raising the awareness of, of being with it. Now that there's a wonderful. Buddhist lineage, spiritual teacher, meditation teacher called Tara Brach, who talks about rain, recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. So you recognize, oh yeah, this is happening to me right now. Okay, I'm going to allow it. Not allowing it in the sense of I'm going to act it out on somebody else. But I'm going to be with the experience. And then investigate it. Okay, what is this really all about? And then nurture that little person that had to suppress all that rage. It's a nutshell view of it. But in other words, there's ways of working with it through the body that doesn't involve either suppressing it or acting it out, but in experiencing it. 